we'll come back. So, for those of you who um, haven't seen me on Venerable Chandra's uh, uh, YouTube channel, I'm Venerable Upeka, and um, uh, I'm a uh, I ordained with Venerable Chanda 10, 10 years ago and I've been living in Damasara Nan's monastery in, in Perth all these years until I came here and went to Sydney. So, um, yeah, so I've uh, been dragged into this. <laughs> Um, so we'll uh, have uh, have an hour and a half with you, and we'll um, begin with some meditation. After that, a short Dhamma talk and questions and answers. So, in the view together, from Thank you. Okay, right. So I hope you all ready to um, settle down for another guided meditation. Okay, so closing your eyes and allowing yourself to settle down again. Allowing yourself to draw inwards again. Draw inwards this body and mind. Become aware of the world within. Becoming aware of what is going on in your body. And that is often linked to what is going on in your mind. Sometimes the thoughts in our mind are hard to pinpoint, but the feelings in our body that somehow capture those thoughts 
are much more tangible. So we become aware of the body as a whole. And all the various sensations, emotions that are passing through it right now. noisy ones, but also quiet ones. Our mind usually goes to the noisy ones. The quiet ones are there too. Allowing the noise of our minds to settle down. <coughs> we start to become aware of the quieter ones. the subtler ones, the shyer ones. like a quiet child that is rarely heard. We, we bring it out. We bring our quiet mind out and listen.
in the noisy thoughts and general chatter comes back. We put it aside and go back to that quiet voice, that quiet feeling. a quiet sensation.
having no expectation of what your mind is meant to do. We allow it to be free. not confined to what we want it to be.
slowly come towards the end of the meditation. Before we end, just wishing ourselves well. Our little voice, our little friend, our little mind. Wishing ourselves well-being, peace, ease of mind. Just as we wish ourselves well, we wish all beings, all beings just like us. May all beings also be at ease, free from pain, Free from hunger, free from despair. May all beings find peace in their lives. When you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. Okay, so back to the world again, back to listening, seeing the five sense world. <laughs> and ready for a Dhamma talk. <laughs> so, okay, so well, I uh, thought I'd talk today about um, something that that seems <laughs> that I've been I've been working with for many years, and I thought you'd be very happy to know that. Nuns, after practicing for many years, struggle with the same things. So um, I've been living in Damasar for 15, well, 15 years. And before that, another 10 years of being like a serious Dhamma bomb. Um, and still, you know, it just takes so long to change our minds. And sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's uh, good to know that 
you don't have to be get on top of it all that easily. It doesn't happen all that easily and all that soon either. So um, I thought I might talk today about what what um, sometimes is called the inner critic. The inner critic. That it seems to be that people who, you know, are successful, intelligent, don't have any um, trauma, any major suffering in their life. And yet, when you talk to so many of these people or who come to this monastery or any monastery or even the nuns themselves, they have they seem to suffer from this little voice in their heads that constantly say, God, you did it wrong again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At the end of the day, just remember over and over again the minutest error that you made like seven hours ago, but you can't drop it. So um, there, was a, there, was a, <laughs> there was a nun who was staying here with us uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, a very beautiful seminary actually. Um, she, she was, uh, anyway, she had had a very hard life. She was poor. She was one of 13 children. Her mother was sick all the time. Her father had to somehow feed these 13 children. And she had a hard life. And uh, she, she, we, we became friends, you know, I uh, chatted, uh, you know, chatted about our lives, uh, listening to what I had to say. And she said, you know, Venerable, I just have to ask you, you seem to, you seem to have had the, a loving family. You seem to be loved by your friends and the nuns you live with. You just seem to have, you know, just a lot of people who love you. And yet you're so hard on yourself. Where, you know, she, you know, where is it coming from? And I, uh, and I thought about it and I, go, I, go, I thought, where is it coming from? I have no reason to be. Um, and um, I tried to work out where is this voice in my head coming from? And I thought, you know, it's the voice our society tells us. It's the voice that my education, having, even though I was born in Sri Lanka and I like lived since the age of seven in Singapore and New Zealand, it's the voice of the media, it's the voice of um, CNN <laughs> that my father watches nonstop. Anyway, it's the, it's the voice of our society that says, this isn't right, you know, there isn't enough money. The, Health service should be better. There are bombs falling in 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 um, Israel in, in sorry in Gaza. It's this constant, you know, things aren't right. Things aren't good enough. It should be improved. And so you turn it around on yourself. You know, things aren't right. Things should be improved. Why isn't it right? And so society seems to, you know, we seem to think that. Things should be a particular way and it's not. And so we look at other people on Facebook, on, you know, or around us. They all seem to be happy. They seem to all have their lives together. They all seem to be healthy. They all seem to have well-dressed, lovely clothes. And we think everybody except me. <laughs> Everybody else has it, has it together except me. So, um, so then we start to meditate. <laughs> and we start to meditate. And all that sort of fixing in the world, we all of a sudden turn it around and turn it on ourselves. We take the toolkit of the meditation box, you know, loving kindness, breath meditation, compassion. We turn it on ourselves and we start to repair ourselves. But it doesn't seem to work. And it certainly doesn't seem to work when we want it fast enough right now, which is what we're told. 
on our smartphones, press the button, done, delivered. Arriving on Amazon Prime within 24 hours. <laughs> but that is not the way. Um, <laughs> there's people laughing here. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. We start to meditate and we seem to turn in all this kind of fixing and all this sort of the way it should be on ourselves. And it turns to what Ajahn Suchita calls an inner tyrant. It's <laughs> apparently Ajahn Suchita had two books being, you know, that were printed at the same time. One was called Unseating the Inner Tyrant, and the other one was called Samadhi is Pure Bliss, or something like that. Anyway, the Samadhi in Pure Bliss book was full. It was the file was high and the unseating the inner tyrant book was like all the copies were taken away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see that, you know, you're not the only one. It seems to be that uh, this inner tyrant, this inner critic voice is like uh, just uh, um, a, a painful part of modern society. It's really strange. I, I My mother, who was you know, born in Sri Lanka in 1947, doesn't seem to suffer from it. Maybe it's a society, maybe it was the time she was born, but it seems to be definitely a disease of our age. Yes? No? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, I have to... Um, you know, in the in the uh, monastery in in Perth, where uh, where we live, you know, in um, where I live anyway, when you're a monastic, uh, people come to monastics with stories that they don't usually tell their friends, and stories that you don't tell your you know you don't put up on Facebook, <laughs> and so all these. Happy families that you see, um, beautiful children, Sri Lankans, they are studying medicine, whatever it is, you know, these successful families. And behind the scenes, you hear when they come to the monastery, they pour their heart out and you hear of um, drugs, children going to drugs. You hear about um, families broken by, um, what's the word, cheating on each other, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Infidelity. Yes. Infidelity. Thank you. <laughs> Infidelity. You hear about um, children who are, um, you know, depressed, suicidal, things you don't usually talk about. And this is actually the world we live in and the world that uh, we have to face. So I just want to talk about um, how I deal with these things. <laughs> and perhaps it was, it's something that might work for you. Um, but uh, First of all, to, to remind you that it takes a long time. You know, when I first went on a retreat, a three month retreat in uh, Malaysia, I was 30 years old, I'm 50 now. I came out of the first retreat and I thought, oh my God, this is so awesome. My next three month retreat, no problem. I'm definitely going to come out of Sota Panda. I mean, it's just plain sailing from here. I was convinced. So I put all the places, put, put all, this, all the pieces in place, went to Burma already, you know, for that three month retreat. You know, I gave myself all the time in the world, told my mom, that's it, deal with your problems. I'm off to get enlightened. Don't stop me. <laughs> and uh, um, and <laughs> needless to say, here I am 20 years later, dealing with the most simple problems in life. It is so humbling, dealing with this mind that, you know, gets 
annoyed at petty little things, petty little things in myself, petty little things in others. And just to say to, um, to you, it just takes time. It's so easy to talk about, it's so easy to read the suttas, but we've, we've just been um, conditioned for aeons of lifetimes to behave in this particular way, to have an ego, to have a sense of self that's always trying to find you know, ground. And so to let that go takes a lot of practice and a lot of time. So, um, yeah. So, um, I remember um, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, uh, there's, there's, there in Perth, there's some really lovely nuns, but this particularly very beautiful nun who's extremely smart and capable. And we were in the middle of a, 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 a three-year building project. It was a huge building project. It was a $7 million building project. So the monastery was, you know, basically nonstop building, working projects. And this is one of the nuns who was um, uh, working on that, you know, many hours a day. And, uh, and she said, I remember her saying, you know, it's not about the getting the job done. It's not about this massive building project. It's about the people. It's about the people and the pe how the, it's about getting people together. And it's about um, uh, uh, working together. And then I remember her saying a few years later, you know, it's not about the people. It's about the qualities. It's about the qualities that is not a person. It is about the qualities that we develop. And um, working with this inner tyrant, I used to watch many hours of videos of um, the Dalai Lama, <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, and other people who, you know, seem to have a, uh, have a extremely difficult life. And um, I realized that these people, it's not that they were perfect. It's not that they never made mistakes. The Dalai Lama, I can remember him like, I don't know, his English is no good. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't remember the day he was born. Anyway, plenty of mistakes. <laughs> but um, it's not that they were perfect, but it is the quality of compassion that they had. It was the quality of compassion, the quality of um, kindness, the quality of incredible forgiveness. It was those qualities that I realized the Buddha was talking about. It wasn't about getting the job done. It wasn't about giving a good Dhamma talk. It wasn't about getting A pluses in all your GCSEs. Apparently children nowadays, apparently have to sit 22 GCSEs Someone told me yesterday, her son was sitting 22 GCSEs to, you know, to at the age of, I don't know, 17, 18, whatever it is. <laughs> oh my God, what pressure. So, um, so it is the qualities of compassion towards others and to ourselves. That is what we're focusing on. It is not about getting the job done. It is not about being an A plus student. It is not about remembering which year you were born or having good English. Um, it is about the qualities. And that is what the Buddha spoke about over and over again. 
the um, metta karuna mudita upekka. And so we turn the way we look at the world around, we turn our priorities around and we turn, um, we go against the stream of the world. We go against what the world is telling us to be, you know, beautiful, intelligent, healthy, smart, articulate, <laughs> and turn around and go against the stream of the world and develop these qualities instead. Focus our minds on compassion, on forgiveness, on acceptance, on being imperfect. Yeah. So, when we are this way, we are a gift to the world. How many times, you know, when you meet someone who doesn't judge, who looks at you and has no expectation of how you are meant to behave, the right thing you're supposed to say. When you're in the presence of someone like that, how, how free you feel. And so if we are able to embody those qualities, we are a gift to the world. We are able to um, touch the world in such a different way to a gift, give the gift of um, not judging, to give the gift of, of accepting someone, not expecting anything from them. So um, this is what I <laughs> what I have turned well try to turn my mind towards. And um, so here are some things of how I work with the inner tyrant. So first of all, you've got to recognize the voice. So this voice of the inner tyrant, it comes injected with great conviction and great, you know, it, it great accuracy. It's just so right and so, you know, we, we, are, we, we think we're so smart. Immediately, within seconds, we, we decide on people, places, things, whether they're good or bad. And it just feels so me, and it feels just so correct. So first of all, we have to recognize this voice and not necessarily straight away believe everything it says. So how many times have you, you know, decided that this person was just got it wrong? <laughs> they weren't doing the right thing. They, you know fixed that's it that's not the way to do it and then a day or two later you hear a story about their life you hear you know that they they were they were in pain they were having a headache that day or something and your mind just completely turns around you see them in a totally different light all of a sudden your judgment you realize I was a hundred percent wrong, you know. How could I have sort of bought into that voice that was so right when 24 hours later I feel completely different about that exact same person? How many times have you done that? I've done that many times. I do that regularly. <laughs> so um, the Buddha says that all our perceptions, you know, all our perceptions are biased. We are, they're tinged, even however sure we may be of ourselves, they're tinged by delusion, they're tinged by subtle desires and subtle aversions, subtle per perceptions of the world, that they're just perceptions. So not to believe everything we think, just because we thought it. 
I thought it, so it must be accurate. Um, first of all, not to necessarily buy into everything we think. And so that goes for other people too. I think a lot of a lot of comments should be come 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 with, and that's my opinion. And that's just my opinion, because people say things with such conviction, but you should add the little bracket. And that's their opinion. And that's my opinion. <laughs> so not to believe everything that other people think and not to believe that everything we think. So we start by recognizing the voice in our head and learning not to necessarily trust it. So then we work on things that we can trust, things, qualities to develop. So um, it's important to feel good about ourselves because it's when we're, we feel, you know, I'm not good enough, I have done the right thing. It's very, very difficult to see, you know, see the wood from the trees. Sorry, the wood from the trees? The wood from the trees. And so it's important to actually feel good about ourselves. Um, I remember when I started practicing a couple of, uh, well, this is about 15, 20 years ago anyway, I used to have a friend um, who um, I spoke to every night and we kept a diary of the good things that we did. So we kept a diary of, of, um, of, uh, of keeping the five precepts, for example, the simple things. I didn't kill anybody. I wanted to kill somebody, but I didn't <laughs> kill anybody today. <laughs> um, a key reminding ourselves of the, you know, keeping a little diary, reminding ourselves of the goodness of our lives. It isn't anything magnificent. It isn't anything, um, you know, dramatic. You didn't jump into the ocean and save a drowning dog, but you got off the seat and 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 um, uh, let somebody sit down. You helped somebody cross the road, open the door, and let someone else pass through. Little simple things that we did for others and we did for ourselves. You know, we actually did some exercise today. It was much easier to sit in front of the phone. Diddle, 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 diddle. But instead, <laughs> I went out and got some exercise. Good on me. Um, yeah, so many things, so many acts of times that we could have said something and we didn't. We just held that word. Held our, word, uh, held our words back and didn't hurt somebody. The number of times that we, you know, um, didn't hurt somebody. We were harmless. We, we could have, I know, may often it's the words, the words that we didn't say, the thoughts that we didn't think. Just reflecting, I wasn't, I didn't hurt anybody, at least for a couple of hours. <laughs> I didn't hurt anybody. So to reflect on our goodness, because there is so much. It's the inner critic that keeps the tab of, you know, your sins, number two. <laughs> Sin number two, pasted on your, <laughs> on your computer screen to remember. Um, but we don't uh, remember the goodness of our lives, the good qualities, the times that we have been kind, the times we have forgiven, the times we have not done what could have harmed somebody. So, Ajahn Brahm talks about um, the 70% rule. I'm sure you, you did, maybe he talked about it already. He talks about it all the time. He may have talked about it already, but the 70% rule. So remembering that 
seven <laughs> that um, remembering that 70%, we are not meant to be 101%. We're not meant to get 100% and one of everything right. 70% is good enough. So we remember, heck, definitely more than 70% of the time, I was a harmless person. I didn't hurt anybody. So other ways of feeling good about ourselves is to just have gratitude. You know, we live in a country that doesn't have bombs falling on our homes. We have water to drink. We have, for the most, all of us, we have food to eat. We have a meal coming. You know, we don't have to wonder, are my children going to eat today? We don't have to worry about not having a roof over our heads. We have heating, we are comfortable. Compared to most of the people on this planet, we are extraordinarily fortunate. And so to sit back and feel grateful, feel grateful for being healthy, feel grateful for all the people who have supported your being alive today. From the farmers who grew your food to the drivers who delivered it to a supermarket, to the people at the checkout counter, the people who worked on the streets, keeping the, picking up the rubbish and trimming the bushes, so much. So much has been done for us to be alive today. To, so to just sit down and feel grateful for all the people, all the people who have worked hard so that we have the possibility to be alive right now. And also feel grateful, like just to be able to breathe. Grateful to have the earth under our feet. Grateful for these four elements that just give. I always walk on the ground and for some reason, perhaps because I, um, well, don't have TV. <laughs> but uh, living in a forest for so many years, you just have so much uh, appreciation for um, nature, for the earth. Because it is the earth that gives us food, that holds us, gives us shelter. When I walk, I always remember the words of um, the Buddha, be like the earth, O Rahula. The earth that expects nothing from you. We spit on it, we, we defecate on it, we throw things on it, but the earth never complains. It's always there holding us. So anything, any perception that you have, these are the ones that come to my mind, to bring that sense of gratitude at the end of our day, gratitude to all that is there, all that we have that we take for granted. And so then we are able to have a little bit more gratitude towards ourselves as well. Gratitude even for the unpleasant things in life, because these unpleasant things in life are the ones that help us to grow. They're very much part of our, our practice. They're very much part of the sansara. So when we have a heart of gratitude, we're able to open our hearts to things that are not always pleasant. So, 
my goodness, I talk a long time. <laughs> and so when we have, um, when we feel good about ourselves, then we are able to turn around and be able to be honest with ourselves. Part of the practice is being utterly, brutally honest. But it's only when we feel good about ourselves that we are able to turn around and be honest with what is going on in our minds. A couple of years ago, I think three or four years ago, I'd, I'd been in the monastery for about um, 10 years by then. And um, I have to say, I've had a very comfortable monastic life. <laughs> I uh, had uh, have nothing much to worry about and live with very nice people. And I, I realized very honestly that um, I, my, I really couldn't say that my mind was progressing. In fact, you could say I was becoming kind of lazy. <laughs> I used to nap a lot, you know, I was very comfortable. <laughs> Enjoy my lunches, chat to my non-friends. And you could say that really, I had become quite complacent. But, you know, it took an incredible amount of honesty to start to notice these things. And so part of the practice is, um, is to have that beginner's mind, to have that mind that says, look, uh, what is going on? What am I thinking? Where are those places in, that, in my mind that I'm just not noticing, you know, that I just slide past? But something is, something is making me slide past. So taking the time every day to um, investigate, to explore, to honestly explore, <laughs> to honestly explore what, is, what happened in your mind, why did you react in a particular way, um, what is driving you? Why, why are you upset or why are you, you know, elated? Genuinely exploring what makes you tick. So I do this every day um, when I have a bit of time in my meditation to, to just, you know, something that was bothering me. Why is it bothering me? Trying to get to the bottom of it, you know, giving yourself time to explore and investigate what is going on in my mind. So, so I'll just uh, uh, come close to the end now and just, uh, you know, remind ourselves again that this path is, it takes time. It, uh, even, at, you know, we reduce our expectations. We reduce our expectations of ourselves and we reduce our expectations of others. Ajahn Brahm says he's reduced his expectations of others to zero. I don't know if you remember saying that, but I think he was talking about his monks. Anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, to we we um, get a perspective on you know how many lives we've had. The Buddha says that you know this um, the blood you have shed from having just your head chopped off the blood you have shed from just from having your head chopped off it is the four great oceans could not be filled 
by that amount of blood. That's how long we have been in sansara. The tears we have shed, all of that is greater than the waters of the four great oceans. So we've been here a long, long time. And so we have to lower our expectations, be humble and um, have faith to keep walking this path. The Buddha says, um, drop by drop, the water jar is filled. Likewise, the wise man or woman, or gender non-binary, <laughs> little by little, fills himself with good. So, um, just uh, to remind us to have that faith to keep going, because uh, what else are you going to do with your life? <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll stop there and uh, open up for questions. Oh, questions that go to questions to go to Q and A, Annie, and then then they come to me. Okay. Okay, so there's a question from Jeff. How do, sorry, there's a question. How can we ensure that we translate our mindfulness into practical actions on environmental and social issues in order to alleviate the suffering of other beings? Yeah, very good question. Um, because sometimes I realize when you start to meditate, you become quite kind of focused on yourself and become a little bit, uh, in a way, I'm a bit narcissistic. Um, so it's important to, to um, recognize that. I've recognized that in myself, you know, um, that uh, this practice is not just about me, me, me and improving me and my inner tyrant and all the rest. And realizing that in the end, we are um, practicing for the benefit of all beings. So for me, I have to actually... Um, uh, remember that and um, uh, remember to go out into the world and take my practice out into the world, not just sit in my comfortable monastery. <laughs> but um, remember that this is a gift to be shared. So uh, um, get involved, you know, don't stay at home a, a hermit. It's very tempting. Get involved in in um, helping the people in your society to to uh, uh, bring the bring your yourself, you know, the gift of your presence to the people in your workplace, the people in in um, who are uh, working for social justice. Give one pound a day to some charity that has sent you an email. You know, those, those little small acts, it's important to make the effort to care. It's definitely important to make the effort to give. So we take our mindfulness, we take our practice, and we take it out in the world. We don't sit um, um, comfortably on our meditation cushions. So it's just an effort. Just do it and see how it works out. Um, yeah.
then thank you for the beautiful meditation and for the opportunity of this retreat. The inner critic talk was amazing, capital letters. <laughs> My inner critic needs a very basic suggestion. I'm trying and have not set have not set yet. yet. Oh, have not yet found a daily routine, and I'd love some help. Um, some help. Meditation, waking up, little walk, breakfast. Is there any order to this that might help? How do you do it? Thank you. So, and I'd love some help. So a daily routine that you'd love some help. Meditation, waking up, little walk, breakfast. Uh, is there any order? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. Start. Where would you start? Body needs. Okay, there's a, oh, there you go. There's a suggestion. Ask what your body needs. My body says stay in bed. <laughs> 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 so uh, sometimes it's good to do not what your body needs because early in the morning your body is generally quite uh, quite dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so I would perhaps start with a, a little walk. You know, that sounds nice. Followed by meditation, <laughs> then breakfast. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, meeting people where they are and holding space for them is sometimes more important than giving them advice or than referencing the suttas to them. When laypersons reach out to you with their problems, how much counseling skills do you use to help them? And do you find it easier to relate to them the more experience you gain? Hmm. Well, um, for me, I am a listener. So when people come to me with problems, I find the greatest gift I can give them is to just listen and um, make them feel heard. You know, most of the time we really know what our solution is. Deep down inside, we really know what we need to do. But when you, when you have someone who just listens, it helps that person to just unbundle the whole process. When they unbundle it, they manage to come to their own conclusions. So I, I find uh, just listening and just being, a, um, like you said, holding space is, is the, the best gift I can give. And uh, how, may, how much counseling skills? I have no counseling skills. As nuns, we get no counseling skills. We should all be given and go, go on a course on counseling when we become nuns because uh, um, people come with their problems. So yeah, no counseling skills. And you just learn, from, learn on the job, really. Mm. <laughs> okay, so another question. Yes, and the more experience you gain, yes, you just kind of use your, use whatever skills you have. Unfortunately, at not, as nuns, we do not actually have any lessons in counseling. Um, okay, last week I was listening to Joseph Goldstein telling that during a retreat, that during a retreat had asked Suzuki Roshi, how would you resume how would you resume the entire Buddha Dhamma using two words? And Roshi replied, everything changes. How would you reply to the same question? How would you reply to the same question? You know, I remember uh, my grandmother had on, uh, on her fridge, um the the words do not react so i keep that in my mind sometimes uh, 
Um, because often we straight away react with, I like it, I don't like it. <laughs> and then we say it as well. <laughs> yeah. How would I how would I summarize the entire Buddha Dhamma in two words? Why are you asking me? <laughs> um uh, yeah. Um yes. Another one I heard was um know what you're doing and know uh why you're doing it. Hmm. Know what you're doing and know what it, why you're doing it. Hmm. Anyway. Okay. Why are my dreams like an old movie? The inner critic there creates some suffering that does not exist when I am awake. Thanks for a wonderful retreat. Why are my dreams like an old movie? The inner critic there creates some suffering that does not uh, exist when I am awake. Thanks for a wonderful retreat. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Dreams. Dreams. You know, um, I've heard uh, I heard an analogy that um, our waking life is not too different to our dreams. They are as uh, inaccurate as seen through a lens as much our as our dreams are. You know, um, we perceive things. Uh, um, to be real when they're not. So dreams are not too different from reality. Inner critic creates some suffering there that does not exist when I am awake. Maybe it is there at the back of your head when you are awake, just don't quite recognize it. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know much about dreams, but um, they're probably a reflection of, of what is going on in our subconscious and our minds that get a chance to play out. Yes. Okay. Okay, so next one. Thank you, Venerable. I feel so much of your compassion and loving kindness to all beings. What a wonderful Tao talk. Thank you, Venerable. Oh, you're most welcome. I thought I'd talk about something. You know, I think when you suffer, the greatest gift you can give is you understand how other people feel. So, um, that's the best thing about suffering. You can help someone who's been in the same boat, who is in the same boat. So I, um, I, uh, I console myself this way. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that uh, we've come, oh, come pretty close to the end of the questions. Dreams. Hmm. Hmm. Ah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your beautiful uh, talk. Your un honesty impresses and inspires me. Now my question. You mentioned the many, many lives in which we have shed our blood and tears. This brings me to the question whether in Buddhism we look upon time as something progressive. Is it that our former lives have all happened one after the other in time, or could it be that time is seen as a circle so that we could be reborn in the past or have had previous lives that were thousands of years ahead of our time? 
And how would this relate to the concept of karma? Wow. Yes, it will. And head lies ahead of our time. Hmm. Well, and we at the time so that we could have been reborn in the past of it. Previous lives that are a thousand years ahead of our time. Hmm. Well, the concept of linearity is past and future. The concept of circular is that it is repetitive rather than that there is past and future, that it just goes on and on and on and on and on. There is no kind of uh, past, future. So you wouldn't say that it is uh, future lives, but um, a sense of um, unendingness, you know, of it um, just not a future life that we have already experienced, but just that it just goes on and on and on. Um, the, the point that the um, Buddha is trying to make is not to know that have I experienced this already and now I'm experiencing it now because I experienced it. That's not the point. The point the Buddha is trying to make is that um, we have to break the cycle. It's not about what happened, but we have to break the cycle. And um, that's what the Dhamma is about. It's not about figuring out what was in the past, what was in the future. You, you can't figure that out. Um, he just says that it just is... Um, it just goes on. And our job, our job is to recognize this. And he teaches us a way to come to the end of it. And how does that relate to the concept of karma? Um, uh, well, karma has it, it has effects. So what you do now has an effect on your future. It, if you do uh, karma that is good, it reads, leads to a future that is good. If you do karma that is bad, it leads to a future that is bad. If, But the most of the time, we do a karma that is a little bit good and a little bit bad. It's gray. And so it leads to a future that is good and bad. So what we're trying to do in the practice is to create conducive karma that helps us puts us in a position to be able to understand the Dhamma, puts us in a position to be able to practice, puts us in a position that we have the conducive conditions to be able to realize the truth. So um, the uh, purpose of the understanding of karma is to be able to to put in place karma that will help us to grow on the path. I wonder if that answers the question when Ruchanda says good enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I really liked when you talked about gratitude to the earth. Could we take nature as our meditation teacher? Does every teaching have to be in words. Absolutely no teachings when they are words, as Ajahn Brahm says, words get in the way of our experience, you know. Um, nature as our meditation teacher. Um, I don't know if I can remember it. There's this beautiful verse. Uh, uh, 
Earth is a storyteller, O oh, meditation master. Sky reflects to us that which we cannot see. Um, forest, the great earth temple, something like that. Stone is a storyteller, O oh, meditation master. Sky reflects to us that which we cannot see. Forest, the original cathedral, great earth temple, something like that. Um, yeah, living in the forest in Australia, you definitely, it is definitely your teacher. Um, then, Thanks for the wonderful talk. Know the inner tyrant very well. I have the book by Ajahn Suchito. Thanks, Venables, for the wonderful retreat. And Richard says, Richard Panel. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think we've kind of come to the end of the questions and I hope that was satisfying. Uh, I'll definitely have to go back and think about the answers. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, we come to the end of the session and I hope you can continue to practice um, keeping quiet and keeping your mind inside and in silence. Uh, three more minutes. Ha ha ha. Thanks. <laughs> That's any. <laughs> okay. So uh, tomorrow we meet again at uh, quarter past six for our silent meditation. And then again at 8.30, I believe, with Ajahn Brahm. Right. Uh, yeah. That's the end of the session and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day and see you in the morning. It's sad, sad, sad. <laughs> <laughs>